Welcome to the Scalable Real Estate Investing Podcast, where we discuss the most scalable strategies, tools, and approaches to successfully invest in real estate. Learn how to make the most impact of your time, automate your real estate investing business, find off-market deals with minimum time invested, and leverage your capital to create as many income streams as possible so that you can achieve true financial independence. Thank you for tuning in. I'm your host, Mason Clement. Hi, Scalable Investors. Before we get into today's episode, I'd like to tell you about a group that I'm a part of called Hivemind. If you're serious about taking the next step in your real estate investing career, then this is definitely a group that you need to join. Some of our members are making $90,000 or more per month and as much as $300,000 on just one deal. And at the same time, you don't have to spend thousands of dollars like you typically would joining other mastermind groups. This is only $99 per month. And when you join, you'll gain access to a robust integrated CRM software that allows you to track your leads, run automated triggers, and ultimately scale your marketing efforts. So the difference here is that you're not left high and dry, but gain access to a support network that allows you to use that tool and learn from other more experienced real estate investors. So to learn more, go to scalablerei.com slash hivemind. That's H-I-V-E-M-I-N-D. Thanks a lot. Let's get into the episode. Hi, Scalable Investors. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Scalable Real Estate Investing. I'm your host, Mason Clement. And today we have with us Adam Stern, who is founder of Strata SFR, which is a really interesting platform that connects developers and builders of single family residential homes to active SFR investment funds. Uh, Prior to launching Strata SFR, Adam co-founded and ran an online single family rental marketplace called Own America. So it's a wealth of experience here. Really happy to have him on the show and looking to get into things. So Adam, what's going on today? How are you doing? Good, Mason. How are you doing? Doing great. It's a beautiful Monday and just happy to you know be a part of it. <laughs> coming off pet, the Passover holiday, coming off Easter, it's nice. I'm all had family over my house. I'm all refreshed now. Now ready for the next leg of the, uh, the spring market. Yeah, it's amazing. There's the first quarter is already done with the year, you know. It's yeah, by. it's fun. The older you get, the faster time flies by. It seems like it should be the other way around, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, s- speaking of old, not to be a, a <laughs> to, to make a punch at you there, but I know you have a lot of experience. And what I like to do with every guest on my show is just first discuss the background, uh, what got you into real estate and right. what brought you to today. Yeah, so um, my background's uh, kind of attached to the whole single family rental industry. Um, I... I Back in 2008, when the crash happened, I ended up hooking up with a, a partner that owned a really large real estate brokerage company, and we formed a company called Own America. And that, that that turned into, it wasn't always, but it turned into an acquisition force for some of the largest Wall Street landlords that had bought up foreclosures during the downturn and to turn them into rental properties. And during kind of like the middle part of the 2010s, uh, we really created a trading platform for SFR portfolios. And I became a very specialized kind of broker that specialized in talking to institutional investors and funds and private equity firms, and those kind of professional investment funds and got them to buy SFR portfolios that were all over the country uh, in, in mostly key markets throughout the Southeast. So I got to know really well this idea of brokering large off-market transactions. Uh, and the asset type that I specialized in was uh, single family rental portfolios. Uh, lo and behold, the MLS and the retail market got so hot and crazy uh, in the later part of the 2010s, 2019, 2018, that people realized it was actually, in some markets, a smarter move to build new construction homes for rents than it was to buy existing homes in portfolios of rentals. So uh, when I sold my company with my partner in 2018, uh, I decided to, to open up Strata SFR a little over a year later. Because all my clients were asking me, hey, Adam, go and find me. These, these portfolios we're finding are great. We really like new construction and we want opportunities. So I learned really swiftly over the course of 2020 how to put together build front deals, which range from finding builders with finished products all the way through to as early as people that have raw land, essentially, um, and everything in between. So that's kind of how I came to understand the the task of build for rent uh, and how raw land and land development and building development all plays into that. Okay. So how does your platform work? Are you, are you essentially yep. just 
having the broker pay you a commission or how's that work? So it, it depends, it depends on the situation really. So I'll tell people how I started. And I think with any platform, whether it's a marketplace platform or whatever, starting with the end in mind is always the best move. And to me, that meant talking to a lot of buyers, a lot of buyers about where they want to buy, how they want to buy, the structure in which they want to buy, kind of the, the type of land, the type of rental properties they want to own. So what I did was I, 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 I interviewed very, very, you know, methodically about 25 of my top institutional investors. And I found out of the 25, like 13 of them all had a very similar kind of buy criteria or, or, or thesis on the space. They all wanted to own in southeastern markets like Smile States from Raleigh to Jacksonville as far west as is Alabama, um, some ten Tennessee. And um, I saw, all right, so out of these 13, if I, if I find certain kind of deals, it would appeal to a big swath of them. So I, I kind of focused on that. I figured out what a big swath of my buyers wanted to buy, and I set myself to the task of finding that stuff. Um, and I started out kind of, I'm a more... I'm more of a trial and error guy. I like to actually talk to people and figure out things while I'm on the go. So I started calling builders and I said, hey, you know, I've got money or capital behind me and they're all looking for these characteristics, you know, 75 to 175 lots, single family detached, townhomes, you know, units that range in price from, you know, 180 to, 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 to 325, you know, here are the characteristics, you know. No more than five miles away from a major interstate. No more than uh, uh, three miles away from an amenity like a grocery store. No school scores lower than average or five. All these things. And what I found out was that, you know, luckily enough, in the early stages of COVID, builders were pretty freaked out. And they didn't know what the real estate market was going to do. So I was able to make a, a couple of deals with real estate builders who thought, like, reducing their risk away from the retail market was a good idea. Uh, and then in like the later part of 2020, when they realized that not only was COVID not going to have a negative effect on the, on the, on the new construction market, the, the, the residential market, um, they all pulled back and they didn't want to sell anything to the investors at any bit of a discount. So what I realized was I needed to kind of come up with a different methodology of, of how to find new construction projects. So I thought, well, why don't I go to the same place the builders are going to? You know, the builders are all engaging land developers people that own land positions and are developing those into residential lots. And that bears some fruit, you know, it was basically me competing with the builders for the same lot positions. Um, and that gave me the ability to come back to the land uh, or, or the builders once I've locked up a land position with the developer and give the builder that I was asking for a deal before an actual job, a fee built. And I felt like that was a pretty valuable thing for me to be able to do for some of the builders that I was working with. Um, and then I figured, you know, why not start competing earlier on with the same people the lot developers are buying their land from? So I started going to the entitled land people, people that own land positions. They were just getting them entitled in order to sell to the horizontal developers. Uh, and I started to try to win deals like that and then bring in the horizontal developers, the engineers, to actually do the infrastructure work so I can bring in the builder. And I figured out this really cool kind of methodology of no matter where I insert myself into the deal, there's always the same builder, there's always the same buyer at the end, but I can insert myself in the different you know, parts of the deal based upon the opportunities that I find. And uh, I don't think it's too similar from what most land developers or land investors want to do. They basically want to go out there and they want to explore the universe of, of land opportunities that they can find, whether they're raw land that needs to be rezoned or whether it's zone land that needs to be entitled or whether it's entitled land that needs to be developed. And they figure out <clears throat> what value they can add and, and how much money they can make for that value. Um, I happen to know I can make my money by being this middle person that's able to kind of orchestrate this all and, and make a fee for, you know, all the parts that I add value in. Um, so in a long-winded response kind of way, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> okay, so like the east stage of the supply chain, I guess is what you call it. You're getting paid a commission. Yeah. Uh, well, what, what paramounts to a commission? Um, I'm more making a margin, you know? Um, so, 
Uh, yes, to answer your question, I, I, I'm making what's paramount to a fee on each part of the on each part of the stage, and it's all being paid by the ultimately it's all being paid by the buyer at the end of the day. You know, um, like if I find entitled land that could be bought for fifteen thousand dollars a blank, and I know the ultimate buyer needs to buy a unit for two hundred thousand dollars, I know that that blank can be if that blank can be developed, you know, into a lot for X number of dollars and the lot can be developed into a home for X number of dollars. There's a spread between each of those inflection points and every step of the way, when I bring in the new player, whoever's funding that step will essentially pay me the fee. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so are you actually taking some principal positions and purchasing the land? Not often. I, I don't often put my own money into the deal. Um, okay. I, I'm often locking up or negotiating each stage of the of the process um, at a set price, and then bringing in the next player for a small margin higher. So I'm not actually putting out any money. I'm just helping people move their product along the way, like a broker would. Um, mm -hmm. Except instead of asking people for a commission of one or two or three percent, I'm basically figuring out what my what my margin can be on each one in order to deliver a finished product at a certain yield. Okay. Yeah. I look at it like, I look at it like there's, there's this very, each deal is like this. There's only so much room in it. Right. And you got to plug in these players that have to make money in each segment of the deal. And like, depending on how good the deal is, there might be a little bit margin, might be a little more margin here or here. Um, and that's how I structure them. Okay. Got it. Yeah. I kind of picture it as like a double close. Kind of, yeah. Um, it's not too dissimilar, um, except I'm. I guess this is just me being new to the new to the space. You know, only doing bill for rent for the last you know year and a half. Although knowing it really, really well in the SFR space, not bill for rent, but knowing the process of, of putting deals together in the SFR space, um, I'm I'm always wary about presenting myself as a principal when I'm not. So even if I kind of act like a principal. I let everyone know that I'm not putting out my own money. I'm not acting as a principal. I'm acting as a person that's paramount to a broker along the way. Um, I find the, especially in the, like the wholesaling space, the, uh, you know, you talk about the fix and flip space, um, the land investment space, <clears throat> there's so much, I guess you could say moral ambiguity <laughs> that's, you talk to people that you just can't get a feel for what the hell they're doing and how they're making their money. I always feel like the best thing about this business is being able to be the most effective thing about what I do in this business is being able to be totally transparent and totally fair about what I do because I don't want anyone to misunderstand how I'm making my money and how I'm adding that value so other people can make their money. Um, I think in real estate deals, that's probably the most important thing in building long-term relationships is kind of just putting your cards on the table so that people can see what you're doing and how you're doing it. And then letting people decide whether or not they want to be a part of it. Um, I hate when I get involved with people and then I'm misled at the beginning to believe they're a principal when I found out they're not. Um, it always gives me kind of a, makes me, makes me have a, a scummy feeling about it, you know? Um, so I try to avoid that. Okay. Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, in terms of the size, is there like a minimum size? I know you mentioned earlier like 75 lots, but what do you typically work with? So I say there's a minimum as much as there is a target, right? So like all the buyers that I had talked to, most of them kind of fit into this range of, uh, let me qualify that answer. There are different kinds of buyers with different kinds of targets. So one category of buyer that I have in my kind of network is institutional capital allocators. These are companies that raise institutional capital from sovereign wealth funds and from pension funds. And part of that strategy, and with that strategy, they're looking for a very specific thing. And those kind of buyers are looking for, <clears throat> they're looking for projects between 75 on the low end to 250 on the high end, right? And that's a big part of what I look for. I look for that kind of, sized project, either townhomes or single family detached, but those are big deals and those are hotly contested deals. So a lot of what I do are not for those institutional capital allocators. It's to 
the next kind of tier of buyer down, which are the more opportunistic entrepreneurial uh, real estate investment funds that are funded by mainly private equity and, and private capital. Um, they need a little bit higher yields because their exit ultimately is going to be to the institutional investors. And a lot of those guys are just putting together these portfolios in a very tight geographic area. So they'll buy things like a, a 40 to a 100 unit townhome or single family detached community. And a lot of what I find is that because that those are a lot more abundant. Um, and then kind of the, another buying group are like the more, you know, high net worth individuals, just like smaller private investors that maybe use their own money. And they'll buy all the above, you know. Um, whenever I can't place a deal, I kind of go to them. And if the deal is good enough, they'll always take a swipe at it. So I've got these buckets that I've, uh, that I've, uh, I've created or I figured out. And depending, again, thinking through the context of, you know, my business, I want to go out into the world and I want to be able to meet people and tell people what I do. And I want to be able to kind of just have them bring me whatever they got, you know, good, bad, or ugly, and have me decide what's going to make sense for my business based upon these different buckets. And that's kind of the, that's the way I look at it. Okay. Do you ever work with land investors that might have like one or two lots in a certain subdivision and they could flip them to you or to your builders? Because, all the time. I come across those deals all the time. In fact, um, one of the guys, a, a junior associate that I just brought on had called a, um, a, a private investor in Charlotte, like Concord, which is an area that's just, just east of Charlotte. And he had 19 individual lots in a single subdivision. And he was just selling them off one by one. And he had sold one off to First Key Homes. Um, and he was like, hey, would you like to buy a couple, you know, or, or bring in a couple of investors to, uh, to, to buy the lots? And I was, it's on my, it's on my schedule of things to do, but there's like four other things that I think would be more fruitful in terms of like actual dollar volume than spending time on that. So <clears throat> I guess just, that's just a function of how big I am right now. I got to pick and choose what I do based upon what I think the ultimate value of it is. Um, and that those kind of things come across my head all the time. I just, I generally don't have a lot of guys to, to handle it. I don't handle it. And it's just a matter of spending the time to send it out into the world, which I don't have a lot of people that do that. Okay. So you just kind of divert those to directly to your builders and your network or who are you pushing those to? I'm not really pushing them anyone right now. I'm just kind of letting them sit. You know, if, if I've got 20 things going on and I'm trying to juggle 20 things with my analyst and my junior associate, and my marketing company, Generally, uh, a one or two lot deal is not gonna not gonna ring very high on my priority scale. Okay, that makes sense. So, um, I was wondering, how long does it take for a developer to to finish a community? Do you know, or do you? Is that yeah. like so far beyond? No, you're I know, okay. I, 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 I've got a pretty good feeling for it, even though it's you know it's, it's happening outside of, of what I do. Um, I'll give you an example. So. Um, We've got a deal uh, right now. It's a perfect, perfect deal for the question. Um, it's a hundred, sorry. It's a 205 lot subdivision of townhomes in a place right outside of Wilmington, North Carolina. And we're coming into the deal at the level where the landowner is, the landowner owns the land and it's fully entitled. And a lot of the work's been done in terms of this, the, 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 the research in order to, bring it to the next level, which is the horizontal, horizontal development, right? So my guys are coming in with the land's fully entitled and they are gonna be developing the, the infrastructure. That development of the infrastructure, I mean, depending on how big the lot is or the land or the topography is, can be anywhere between, I should really qualify the answer. This lot is about 30 acres. So for a lot this size, it'll likely take between six and nine months to develop that land. Um, and that's pretty common, I think, depending on how good your land development team is. It could take longer, depending on a number of factors, including the, to the, to the topography, um, the weather, whether it rains outside and where you live in the country or what, what, what season. Uh, so, you know, don't forget you're moving around physical materials and it depends on all the things that come along with that. But six to nine months for... Uh, a project that big to develop into pad lots is a pretty typical thing. 
once it's developed into pad ready lots, now you're bringing in a builder to actually build the, you know, pour the foundations, build the homes, and then, you know, finish the units. And usually that goes in a clip of, let's call it the first 10 units, 10 to 15 units might take three months to, um, to build. But once that's done, you know, and the builder has all their systems in place, they can usually pump out, you know, between 10 and 15 units every month after the first tranche is actually uh, uh, delivered. So that's a typical build for rent cycle. You know, the first 10 units in the first th in three months, then 10 units a month every month after that until it's complete. Okay. And I guess you're earning your margin along the way as each phase is completed. I do. Yeah. So um, I have a deal that's closing next month. Uh, I sold, it was my first deal actually last year. Um, I sold 55 single family townhome units um, in here in Charlotte at CO. And those units are just being finished starting in May. And I'll get paid on the first eight units that are delivered by the, by the builder. And then I'll get paid for the next eight units, the next eight units until I make my whole fee which is paramount to a commission here in Charlotte, because I'm a broker here in Charlotte with a, uh, a North Carolina license. Um, I'll, I'll get paid when those things close. And on the, on, you know, on the, the, the Wilmington deal, I'll get paid my entire fee on the land closing when they actually close on the land, because um, I'm not going to wait to get my fee until homes are built. So I structure my fee in a way so I can get paid early in the process when I put together deals that are, they have my capital coming in early in the process. Okay, so you say close on the land, that's when the builders are purchasing, a closing on it from the horizontal developers? Well, in, in, the, in the Wilmington deal, uh, that's when my buyers are coming in and buying the entitled land from the, the current landowner, right? So okay. that's, a, that's a land closing that's going to happen. Then my buyers are going to bring in a horizontal developer, a GC, to do the horizontal. And then my buyers are going to bring in a builder, right? Um, I'll normally get paid at the land closing and or the horizontal kind of funding and or the building of the actual units, depending on the deal. Okay. That makes sense. Um, and when you say like, Development, I guess they're pouring the streets and also are they installing sewer hookups to like city sewer and water and all that? Just like typically, yeah. I mean, it, 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 again, this is why it's, it's always important to have people involved in a transaction that really know what they're doing and know their parts. Um, that's why I think I'm able to, to create the value that I do because when you, when you take like in this, I'll keep going back to the, to the Wilmington deal. Everyone involved is, is the ultimate professional. They all have tons of experience. The guy that owns the land knows everything about how to develop an entitled land. So develop and entitled land. So he's brought water and sewer to the site. He's um, taken the step of taking the wetlands and then, um, you know, donating them to the local conservancy, right? So it's out of the picture. He's done the work of getting the zoning correct. He's done all that. Um, and that's really attractive for a buyer coming in buying that land. He added a lot of value. Um, and my, my, my buyers are really experienced at taking the entitled land and then managing the entire horizontal development. And that includes putting in, you know, hooking up the water and the sewer on the site to the local water and sewer, putting in that infrastructure, bringing in utilities, you know, putting in the roads, putting in the first pavement, building the units, we're building the pads and then putting in, um, you know, the, the, the finishing touches on the roads. So all those things, including the off, uh, the entrance monumentation, that's all done by the land developer. Um, and sometimes that section of it is not done by the person who's going to own the project over the long term. Sometimes that's done by a middleman that buys entitled land, develops the horizontal, then sells the lots, right? So um, in, in, in my client's case, they're, they're the principal that's going to be owning the asset at the end of the process but they're essentially uh, overseeing that entire horizontal process. Um, and then you bring in the builder. And, and, and if you find a good builder that really understands and knows how to build a quality product on time, on budget, then that process is made all the much easier by the person who's doing the horizontal locking hands with him. When, the, when that, the, the horizontal is done, 
allow him to do that horizontal, to allow the builder to do the vertical piece, starting you know from a, a pad ready lot so we can pour the foundation and get going. Sometimes when you have different parties that are, are less than experienced, or maybe they haven't developed their piece to the very, very end, there's some wood to chop. I call it wood to chop. There's work, some work to be done in every single kind of like lot inflection point, right? Um, sometimes there's zoning uh, elements that need to be sorted out during the time a landowner and a horizontal developer is, are in the process of making that transaction happen. And all that stuff has to be sorted out during the the, the purchasing and the and, and the and the engagement process on that. Sometimes the horizontal guy doesn't do all the things he needs to do in order to get the land ready for foundation pouring, and that'll have to be worked out during the transaction process um, between the, those two parties. Uh, that's why Bill Ferrand is such a kind of exciting space because. People are pouring into the space, the bill for rent space, and not everyone knows exactly what they're doing. So you have transactions that range from super easy with everyone being an expert in their space to maybe a couple novices getting together, <laughs> not exactly knowing and feeling it out along the way. Um, that's why when I started Strat SFR, I really felt like there was a ton of value that I could add um, by helping these parties come together, but also helping the parties figure it out along the way. Although I was new, I got a lot, a lot of people that know what they're doing and I can, you know, pull from that, uh, that, that experience reservoir, you know, and kind of call it my own, which is a, uh, I think it's a pretty special thing. Okay. How often do y'all have to deal with like rezoning? Um, it, it's a factor of every deal I do, um, not rezoning, but zoning. Right. So, um, I tend to key into deals that zoning is pretty much well figured out. But if deals come along that are attractive and the, there's zoning issues, I don't mind kind of spending time on it, you know, depending on what the zoning issues are. Some of them are not insurmountable and we can get past them. It just takes time and money. So I got to figure out whose money <laughs> and if my time and everyone else's time that I'll have spending on it would be worth it. Um, if you're asking me right now, a higher percentage have zoning issues because there's a, a dwindling supply of land and opportunities. So like, you know, when you're, when you're, when you're uh, scraping the cream of the, the cream of the crop, you know, when you're scraping the, the top level of cream on it, there's hardly any zoning issues. But when you get down to the kind of deals that normally wouldn't be looked at because there's so many deals floating out there, you start coming in, you start coming into zoning issues and you got to deal with them. Um, and you don't want to pass up a deal just because of a zoning issue because you don't know if there's a better deal down the, down the road. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, that brings me to my next question. Uh, like what markets are you seeing the biggest opportunity? And I guess seeing like that transition from cream of the crop down to the next level. Well, it, it's a really good question. I'm glad you asked it because it kind of, it kind of plays hand in hand into my theory on how to develop a real estate broker dream and investment business uh, and how to you know create a, a more fruitful network. Um, I find that the core markets around the country are that I focus on are, are the primary markets in um, the Southeast. So like you know major markets with populations over a million, Raleigh, Charlotte, um, Jacksonville, Orlando, all the major markets and some of the tertiary markets now, like Greenville or like Winston-Salem or like, you know, um, Columbia, South Carolina. So what I find are the biggest opportunities for people in my position or your position, maybe some of your listeners are if you are in one of these, you know, primary or even secondary markets and you can get to understand really where, where population is moving, where business is thriving, where jobs are coming in, where people are likely to want to live in the next five, 10, 15 years. The people who generally are able to find these opportunities are people that are local, that know the business owners, that know a coffee shop is opening here, and then a, you know, another store is opening right next door and this area is going to be bustling over the next you know, two or three years, where a guy from the outside just wouldn't know that, right? Um, the people that 
might not have the experience in like land development, land acquisition, land investment, or even built for rent, but know a whole hell of a lot about the nuances of a small market, you know, that's to me the biggest opportunity right now. Because that person can find a guy like me that understands how to pitch that deal to an institutional investor or bring it to a guy like you that can introduce them to a land developer or a lot developer to make a deal happen. Um, even if a person like that that understands the local market only ends up being a bird dog, a bird dog, someone that finds a deal and basically passes it along for a small, you know, a nominal fee. You know, the best bird dogs that I work with hand me a deal and they listen and they are involved intently on the process that I go through so they can learn it, right? And by doing a deal with me, they're made smarter. So the next time they see a deal, maybe they bird dog it again, but maybe they, you know, had the opportunity to learn a little bit more where eventually they won't need me anymore. They can do it themselves, right? And I think the best bird dogs that I re rely on will eventually be in competition with me. And that pleases me to no end. I love the fact that guys that, people that work with me, uh, and if they want to follow what I do closely enough, can learn how to do the whole bird dog thing better to eventually become maybe a broker or even a principal later on in the process. Okay. Um, it, similar to this too, I was also wondering your thoughts on what's driving this, this surge in demand. I've heard a lot of places getting in, in the U.S. getting like $100,000 over asking price and just huge demand for single family homes. What's your thoughts on that? Um, I think that I think that homes in certain areas are going to uh, find a natural equilibrium as they always do because of, you know, supply and demand and interest rates changing. Um, I think we're already seeing it. Interest rates have ticked up, I don't know, about half a point in the last month or two. Um, and I think that's going to affect people's buying uh, 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 ability to buy. So my thought about where prices are right now, there is a massive shortage of resale homes. There's just not enough resale homes to support the amount of people looking to buy homes in certain markets. There's a massive shortage of new construction homes, way short of what people's demands are. And that's a function of lumber prices and supply prices. Uh, all of that's going to eventually figure itself out, right? And it's going to come to an equilibrium. And then prices are going to level out because people are only going to be able to afford so much because of interest rates. So as of right now, I just think it's a, it's, we're seeing a very short-term spike because of these very time-specific things like uh, lumber prices affecting resales. Lumber prices uh, 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 affecting uh, new construction pricing. And the fact there's not enough new construction pricing affecting resale pricing. Um, I'm no genius on the fact, but I just, I see that as probably a pretty good explanation of what's going on right now. Okay. Do you feel like it's also because of um, COVID and people starting to think, oh, I want to move outside of these major urban areas to you know, the, su the suburbs and have their own house and stuff? I do. I think that's like, I think that's going to be a long-term thing you know people started saying that like two months into COVID I'm always like <laughs> wary about that because I know like in reality it's slower than that it takes time for people to want to move out of major population centers and sell their house and move into rentals like that was the media story from like as far as I can remember that was the media story from like two months into the pandemic and I think that's entirely true and it's continued to happen it's going to continue to happen that's why I think people plowed into the single family rental space because they thought that was already happening. Certainly, I think it's going to happen, but you know, I think it's happening right now. I don't think it's happened in massive quantities yet because you're only going to really find that out when you start looking at people's operations over the last quarter or two, right? Um, you're going to see built for rent and SF SFR portfolio <clears throat> excuse me, operators are going to show, you know, new units coming on, new units being leased, new units or existing units being released. Um, yes, to answer your question, I believe that story. I don't believe it happened as early as people or the media had said, but I believe it's going to be a big factor moving forward. Okay. So if I'm a land investor starting out building my, my um, business and just purchasing these vacant 
lots that are not really developed, how would I go about, what would be the best way to build relationships with the horizontal developers? Or I guess, who should I build a relationship with? Is it the horizontal developer or is it the end builder or both? Or what do you think? I think you should find someone with capital to deploy. The first thing you should do is find a build, uh, find a buyer, whether it's a private buyer or whether it's an institutional buyer, family office, private equity, find a capital source that basically is looking for a specific kind of product. If you put the word out there that you're actually out there looking for opportunities and people understand that you're competent and know any bit of what you're doing, um, you find the buyer with money is not gonna be much of an issue. It's all over the place right now. There are capitals out there looking. Um, and then I would, you know, try to, or venture to understand what that capital is looking for. You know, people might look at me, you know, someone might look at me as, as, as a capital source, even though I don't have the money, I, you know, I collect it. Uh, they find a guy like me and they say, Hey, Adam, what are you looking for? Well, where are you? Well, I'm in, you know, I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina. Okay, great. I want you to look in these 12 cities. I want you to look for land that is in proximity to retail, proximity to amenities, proximity to interstate. I want you to find areas where the demographics are, you know, better than, you know, 60% of the population has a bachelor degree or better, school scores above five, and crime stats below the median. Go find those things by talking to lot owners and land developers and landowners and bring those relationships to me. And here's how we're going to work together. Um, that is, to me, the most sensible way to do it. So if you just go out there and start talking to land owners and lot developers and you're being thrown, like, let's say through that process, you got, you find a guy with one lot, you know, and that one lot might be a small payday for you. Well, then you got to go find a buyer for that one lot. Then all of a sudden you're this guy with one lot out there trying to find a buyer. And is, is an institutional investor or a fund buyer going to pay any attention to you? No, probably not. Much better way to do it is to find the guy with the size transaction you want to do and then find that transaction for him. That's just real estate brokerage one-on-one. Okay, that makes sense. So if I wanted to make $100,000 on each deal I do, for example, what kind of size acreage should I be looking for? If you want to make $100,000 on, well, let's do the math. Um, if you want to make $100,000 on a transaction, and let's say you were going to charge a thousand dollars a lot. Well, you want to find lot deals that are a hundred lots big. So you go out there and find a buyer that wants to buy a hundred lots or more, right? Plenty of them out there. And then you go and talk to landowners that can, you know, accomplish putting a hundred lots on their subdivision, right? Maybe it's a 30 acre parcel that's zone R4, you know, three to four lots per acre, hundred acres, right? Or hundred lots right there. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Like, and I guess it does also depend on the area and everything else, but it depends on what you want to charge. If you want to charge $2,500 a lot, then you got to basically find a, a, a 50 acre lot <laughs> or, or I'm sorry, a 50 lot subdivision. And depending on the zoning, that could be seven acres if it's high density, right? Um, it, it really just depends on how you're valuing, valuing your time and your energy and your value, you know, what you're bringing to the table and what your buyers are willing to pay you for. That's the, I guess that's the thing I'm, I'm, uh, I'm most, if I was going to give anyone some real advice, is there's no rules to this thing. It's, I work in this thing called the off-market, and the off-market is the most terrifying and beautiful place in the world where no one's written the rules for you. And it's really entirely up to you and how you want to uh, uh, work in it. And that is really a function of your network. It's a function of who you know, how they see you, how the values perceived that you bring to the table. Uh, and if you can do it well, you can make a lot of money doing something that you pick and you choose. This is my specialty. Here's the value I'm going to bring. Um, and all I got to do is explain to people what I'm doing and you're going to find people that want to work with you. Um, problem with now, nowadays is don't, people generally don't take the time and energy to really understand the nuances of the, of the specialty that they're picking out. Like my specialty is built for it. I spent a lot of time, a lot of energy knowing everything there is to know about every facet of it. If I was doing, you know, uh, if I was doing uh, uh, st self-storage, for example, I have no idea anything about anything doing uh, about self-storage. If I was doing self-storage, I'd learn everything there is to know about every facet of self-storage, and i talk about it and I learn about it. 
uh, or any facet of, of real estate, whether it's industrial or, um, or anything. Okay. Yeah, that's definitely helpful. Um, I guess the, the last question is then what, what do you feel like is the, the best way that I could add value to builders, like beyond just finding lots that meet their criteria? Are there some, any other ways that we're missing? I find I add value to builders by finding deals that they can bid on so that they can build, you know, a project and to add to their pipeline. Um, I find that bringing them fee build opportunities is really, really valuable. I find that bringing them capital sources to buy their opportunities are really valuable. So, uh, you know, depending on the builder, you really got to ask what their, what their pain point is. Is their pain point finding more deals? Then the best way to add value to their business is finding them more deals. Their pain point is knowing how to enter or I'm sorry, exit their opportunity by selling to an investor Then bringing them investors is the best way for you to help them. Maybe they're, Maybe their pain point is lumber is too high and they really need to switch to steel. <laughs> so finding out a good steel supplier for that might be the best way to add value in the short term. Um, I guess it comes back to this point of understanding who your audience is and getting to know what their pain points are and what their, what their needs are and then answering that. Okay. How would I know? I mean, I guess they would tell me if commodity prices like lumber are too high or something, but how else would I figure that out? You just got to talk to a lot of builders. You got to talk okay. to builders. You got to stay in contact with them. You got to be, you have to be very um, methodical and just consistent upon the way you interact with them, how you call them. You don't want to be too invasive. You don't want to call them and badger them, but you want to stay in their worlds. You know, sometimes those relationships take, years to develop to the point where you can do a deal with one of those builders. Sometimes there's a shorter term opportunity. It's time and patience. I was, <laughs> I was at the lake this weekend with my kids. I had four boys and they were all learning how to fish and they wanted to catch a fish right away. They would put it out there. They would reel it back, eh, no fish. And they got really, really upset in 15 minutes. And what I said was uh, like fishing is like life. You got to basically put the fishing line out there and just wait. You got to be patient and let it sit there. And you got to, when, when, when the opportunity arises, hop on it, reel it in. Real estate's very much like that. You just got to put out the, put out your lines, be very patient and tend to your lines while they're out in the water. And then when you see the opportunity to add some value, you reel it back in. Yeah, that's really a great analogy. So um, to wrap things up, what kind of person are you really looking to, to work with right now? And what's the best way for them to get in contact with you? I'm looking for people that have local expertise in all areas from like all, all the smile states. So Southeast United States from Raleigh to Jacksonville, as far West as uh, Alabama, and Tennessee, just people that understand, not even understand, just know where there might be good pockets of land or lots or building going on. Um, they can reach me by going to my website, www.stratasfr.com. And I'd be happy to have me or any one of my staff talk to them. All right. Fantastic. I will okay. be sure to include all the information in the show notes. So thanks again for coming on the show. This has all been really helpful. Yeah, it was great talking to you, Mason. I appreciate you having me. Sure. Thanks. All right. That's another episode of Scalable Real Estate Investing. Thank you for tuning in. Please be sure to leave a review and subscribe on whatever channel you're using to listen or watch these episodes. And also be sure to go to scalablerealestateinvesting.com, scroll to the bottom and fill out the form to sign up for our email. And you could also reach me directly at mason at scalablerealestateinvesting.com. That's M-A-S-O-N at scalablerealestateinvesting.com. If you'd like to get in touch with me to either partner on deals or even be considered to do your own episode on this podcast. Thanks again and have a great day.